Thank you very much all for being here during lunchtime, I guess. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I was a very surprised they actually let me talk about that for two reasons. One is that although I know we always want to, when the, the when a company you know creates this hospitality suites, they always wants to show nice images and everything. And I'm talking uh, much more about physiology and philosophy of the monochorionic twins than actually showing images. So it is nice. And actually, I hope that by the end of what we are going to talk, you you get much more questions and confused than when you came in. So that is not very an explanatory thing. And it uh, actually it's a setup for what I'm going to uh, show you in the next couple of years. So, well, so we are going to talk about the role of fetal defense mechanism in twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And that's very, very briefly. So we all know that the, the important thing of uh, monochorionic twins or twinning is to define if it's mono or dichorionic twins. And this is something you do in the first trimester. First trimester is easy to find out if you have, uh, sorry, just, yeah, if you have the, the some chorion between the two membranes there, which we call the lambda sign, or you have the T that not always looks like a T sign. Uh, that's where you define if it is mono or dichorionic twins. It is very important to define because we all know that monochorionic twins, they have a, a worse a outcome than dichorionic twins and even more than the singleton. Monochorionic twins have five times more chance of miscarriage. There is about 5% uh, more chance of uterine, uh, intrauterine death of both babies. There is uh, about 10, 10%, 10 times more chance of neuro uh, impar uh, development impairment. So it's a worse situation for the babies. Not very good for you, not very healthy for you to be a monochorionic twin. Great part of the, the problems related to the monochorionic twins are because of the placenta. These are images from uh, Professor Elizabeth Lewy uh, and her uh, very well-known work about the connections you have between them. Monochorionic twins, they have one placenta that you can actually divide into three parts. You have one part that belongs to one baby, another part that belongs to the other baby, and then you have a a common part where you have all the connections between them. And the connections are the complicated part. Uh, when, when you have a connected circulatory <laughs> system, that's where you get complicated. And you can have different type of complications. The well-known are those ones. You have uh, trap sequence, which is twin reverse arterial perfusion syndrome, when you have a baby that doesn't develop well, doesn't have a heart, and therefore uh, you have a baby that um, become the pumping twin and that's why you have a, a lot of problem regarding the cardiac stress and some kind of transfusion between the pumping and the, and the uh, cardiac twin. Then you have the one that is most well known of everyone, which is the, uh, what we are going to talk in the next uh, uh, few slides, the twin to twin transfusion syndrome, where the main problem is that you have the connections and then you have a massive transfusion of volume. So you have volume that goes from one side to the other. And that's very important definition because what we are going to talk in the, the next slides. Then you have the, fe the selective fetal growth restrictions. It's a completely different perspective. One baby gets a smaller part of the placenta and therefore it tends to be, uh, well, to develop uh, poorer than the other one because they have a very small share of the placenta like you can see there. Yeah, and then you have the trap sequence, or the sorry, the taps, the twin anemia, polycythemia sequence. That is, you don't have a massive transfusion of volume between two babies. You just have uh, a, um, an hemoglobin uh, transfusion. So it is small transfusion over the weeks that causes that. And this is the better known uh, by, uh, by the neonatologists. We all know how to follow up monochorionic twin pregnancies. There are different guidelines from different societies. That's uh, what ISWOG um, 
um, tell us to do. And this is a mix up of ISWOG and what we do in our uh, center. So we're starting at uh, 11 to 14 weeks. We do the, the first trimester scan for dating, for uh, definition of chorionicity, screen for aneuploidies, for fetal defects and, and everything else. And from, from then on, we look at it every two weeks for the baby, looking for growth, fluid, Doppler, cervical length. Then we reach to the point around 20 weeks where we start looking more at the anatomy, although you can look at an anatomy at the all the time. And then until the end of the pregnancy, you keep on following the baby. And that's good. We know that it works. I'm going to show you a little bit more. But let's go for the twin to twin transfusion syndrome. So what is twin to twin transfusion syndrome? We have just said it's a mi the two babies that are have one single placenta. They are connected. You have connected vessels that goes from one to the other one. And then you have at some point in time a transfusion of a massive amount of volume, uh, the whole blood that passes from one to the other. And because it happens, the basic um, diagnostic criteria is based on the, um, the amount of fluid that each of the baby has. The b baby that receives more blood uh, creates more amniotic fluid, and then you have polyhydramnios that you can find different definitions depending on the side of the Atlantic that you have. Uh, we use the deepest pool of uh, bigger than 8 centimeters at until 20 weeks and more than 10 after 20 weeks. And the other baby that, re that donates the blood, that gives the blood away, so then it produces oligohydramnios. Then oligohydramnios defined as the uh, deepest pool is less than 20, uh, sorry, well, 20 was a lot, 2 centimeters. Um, so that's the image that show that. We still uh, use the Kinteri staging. There is a lot of things that we can argue about, but it's still very simple, very reliable. Everyone can do uh, at any point in time. The only thing you need, uh, it's a basic ultrasound machine without any uh, fancy tool. So very easy to reproduce and that's why it's still very common use. It is, you all know, it is <coughs> classified in in five stages and although it looks like it is uh, an evolutionary process from one to five it doesn't really behave that way so it doesn't give give gives you a certain idea of the degree of complication you have but it doesn't need to go from one to two to three to reach four and five so it it, it, it behaves a little bit different and you use basically doppler bladder and the the amniotic fluid to the S criteria to, to, to define the staging. So stage one, you have the difference in the amniotic fluid, as uh, you saw before. Stage two, you have the difference in amniotic fluid, and then the donor doesn't have a bladder, so it's not producing urine. And then stage three, you have the two that we have in before, plus an abnormal Doppler. An abnormal Doppler, it's uh, um, uh, absent or reverse end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery, or uh, reverse A wave in the ductus venosus. Stage four, you have high drops of one and ball or both, and stage five, you have the death of one or both. Uh, so that's the definition of uh, of the Kinteri stage and the de definition of the diagnostic criteria. the The guidelines that we have for follow up are good in detecting uh, timely the the monochorionic twins with twin to twin, to twin transfusion syndrome, so you can treat them properly. Uh, this is a paper that was published at the end of 2021, <coughs> 2021 uh, and just show that this system, this model of uh, monitoring uh, leads to a double survival of around 64%, a survival of around 64%, double survival of a little bit near 50 and at least one surviving of 79%. And most important that most of the TTTS diagnosed are within uh, possibility of treatment. So stage one and two, 47 percent, 43 percent st is stage three and four, where you can still act. Uh, treatment, you all know, it's the the <coughs> the laser to 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 burn the anastomosis between the two babies. Um, treatment, it's currently um uh perform in stage two to four 
Stage one is arguably, you can discuss that, that there are some centers that defend to do, some defend not to do, because a lot of the stage one TTTS babies, they keep on stage one without need until the end of the pregnancy. So that's uh, a gray area, that's why it's gray there. <coughs> but uh, in the, the most important thing regarding that is that the treatment is very effective. You can have a high survival uh, by doing uh, laser in, in monocoronis twins with twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, uh, double survival of around uh, 70% in stage 1 to 2, 60%, around 55% uh, in stage 3 to 4, single survival that reaches r nearly 90%. So it's a very effective um, treatment. <coughs> First line, it treats the cause. Um, there are risk of complication of any other procedure. If you consider a rupture of premature rupture of membrane of, uh, as a complication, you will have about 50% of them with complication. <coughs> you offer from stage two, and you can question, as I said, what happens in, in stage one, if you do it or not. And then we know how to do the diagnosis of that. We know how to measure uh, deepest pool. And then <coughs> comes to the important bit, which is a uh, little bit of a change in perspective because we, we are very focused on imaging and sometimes we forget what's going on behind the image, sort of uh, um, um, what, what, what's happening there. So we know that monocoronic twins with twin to twin, twin, twin transfusion syndrome, they have blood vessels, they need, they need a specific type of connection, <coughs> we know that, they need a unidirectional connection between them, which is a venous uh, anastomosis, that is an important um, uh, anatomical um, thing that they have to do, otherwise you don't have the, the you may, you, there is a very low risk of having a uh, transfusion. And then you have that, <coughs> the artery of the donor goes to the cot uh, cotyledon and then joins the vein of the recipient, and then the blood that comes from one goes to the other one. There's an empty completely, uh, as uh, there shows, but this Transfusion of a, an important amount of volume <coughs> is what will now start a key chain process that the baby either will manage to compensate <coughs> and you stay uh, more or less stable in the um, starting stages or decompensate and you, you may go worse. What happens there is that there's very basic third year medical school <coughs> um, sort of physiology. So you have the baby that is the donor, that is giving a lot of blood to the other one. And because it's giving a lot of blood, it becomes with less blood, less volume. And then you have kidney hypoperfusion. Then when you have kidney hypoperfusion, you produce less urine, that's called oliguria. And then because you pee less, then you have oligohydramnus. We all know that. Yeah? The interesting fact is that these babies, they have an upper-regulated MRI for renin. And you all remember from medical school or from um, a teaching sessions what the renin angiotensin aldosterone should do. Yeah? And it, it is actually active in, the, in this small baby that is donating and become hypovolemic. So when you have a baby that is donating their kidney hyperperfusion, oliguria, oligohydramnus, it activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and then <coughs> it increases the renin secretion that then leads to an increased angiotensin secretion that will lead to peripheral vascular resistance, an increase in peripheral vascular resistance. This is a response to the hypovolemic baby, so it needs to keep the blood pressure up, so it contracts the small arteries at the end of the baby's body. And at the same time, the aldosterone comes in, kicks in in the kidney, and starts the tubular uh, reabsorption. So it's peeing less and it's still reabsor absorbing more of the, 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 the volume that is passing through the kidney. So we have here what's happening in this baby. On the other hand, you have in the recipient a massive amount of fluid that comes in suddenly, and that that baby needs to deal with its hypervolemia. So there is a lot of blood, it goes to the heart, the heart needs to accommodate that volume, and then it stretches a lot, and when it stretches, it, it releases the natriuretic peptides, which 
goes to the kidney and say, well, we need to work a little bit more, and then start producing more urine, and that, and at the same time, you have a reduced tubular uh, reabsorption, so you start peeing more, and then you have the polyhydramnios. That's, that's the perfect defense mechanism. So one is trying to defend itself from the hypovolemic point of view, and the other is trying to defend itself from the hyper hypervolemic uh, point of view. And in both babies, you have uh, there are some studies that show you that uh, one you have the MRI for renin down regulated, the recipient one, and the other one you have up regulated. So it, it plays an important role here. The interesting part is that in this recipient poor guy that is dealing with the this massive overload of fluid there and is going through all this uh, uh, cardiac stress then trying to accommodate there and then you have the hypervolemia, then you have cardiac overload that goes to a reduced blood pressure and it enters a cardiac, uh, poor cardiac function then it alters the umbilical artery uh, response so you have a different absent or reverse and diastolic flow in the umbilical artery and then at the end uh, the, the venous flow so that's the uh, top of the complication there. So you have this baby that is deactivating the system, renin angiotensin aldosterone, trying to deal with this uh, overload. The heart is uh, very stressed there. But at the same time, the baby that is donating the blood, it's not only donating the blood, but everything that is inside the blood also goes. But sometimes we just think that, well, it's volume, the baby pees out. But that all that volume goes to the baby goes with all the hormones that goes that is inside the donor. It it includes the renin angiotensin aldosterone from the donor baby to the recipient baby. So it gets very messy there. So the baby needs to deal with this the, the donor baby needs to deal with the, with his own pro or hers own problem of the 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 hypervolemic thing and it has to deal also with the activation of the renin system that is going to disturb completely the, the defense that he's trying to do by deactivating that. So then you have uh, aldosterone, <coughs> you have the angiotensin, and you have the renin, and then you have an increase after low, the reduced le right left shunting, and then you have the abnormal left ventricle uh, function, and uh, by the end you have a biventricular um, function affected. So. This is more or less what is going on there from the defense mechanism. You have a baby that's dealing with the hypovolemic system, the other one is dealing with the hypervolemic system, and everything that the one that is suffering with the hypervolemic, it's deactivating, comes the other one and gives uh, uh, blood with uh, hormones that just trying to undermine all the defense mechanisms that that baby one. And it happens uh, at different stage. You can say that the early stage you have a volume transfusion, you have the release of act, uh, uh, vasoactive uh, mediators from the donor, vasoactive mediators uh, transfuse from one to the other, and then you have the polyoligohydramnio uh, sequence with the recipient that start with the diastolic dysfunction because of the overload, and then you have it increases because of the hormones that it receives from the other baby, then you have a in, uh, all the abnormalities in the Doppler and it ends up with a uh, cardiac abnormality. We can assess that and actually um, there are a lot of uh, studies on the cardiac function because we know that the cardiac function plays a role, an important role in adaptation for these babies. We can assess different, there are different ways to assess cardiac function from ca visual cardiac dynamics to speckle tracking that is not playing, sorry for that. And there are classification systems from, from uh, different, um, um, different units where you, you can incorporate the, the cardiac function perspective. The difficulty is that it's not really, it's difficult to reproduce. Not everybody has access to all the tools that uh, you need. Uh, and so it becomes less um, used than the, the system. But it, it, it would play an important role in classifying better the monocorean twins with twin to twin transfusion syndrome. So I'm coming to an end and uh, just to give you a hint. So what else can we see? There, we know that the, um, Monocorean twins with twin to twin transfusion syndrome, they are very messy, not, not only from the perspective of the, the, mm, the, the volume shift, but from the perspective of the, all the hormones that are 
uh, altered in one and the other and should be completely opposite one from another and is also transferred. So there are other pathways that we are currently investigating in the heart, in the cardiothoracic system, in fetal brain and, and, and TGI system that may play an important role in the adaptation of early stages of the twin to transfusion syndrome and then may play a role not only in predicting which are the ones that are going to um, behave worse or they're going to develop to worse uh, situations and those that will actually remain in the mild spectrum of the twin to twin transfusion syndrome. I hope that I could bring you some data, but unfortunately I'm not able to to show you some of these data that we have that are very, very interesting. And for that, I will invite you to come to Lisbon next year. Uh, Monique is going to be there. She doesn't know yet, but I, I'm inviting her. Um, so we can show you a little bit more of this uh, amazing uh, hormonal sta status that will play an important role in the way that we understand in that will play an important role in the way that we follow up monocorneal twins with the twin to twin transfusion syndrome, but they will have also an important part in treatment. Uh, uh, um, as we do nowadays uh, with, a, with a laser, we're going to improve a little bit more with some other stuff. Yeah? So just taking home message, monocorneal twins should be following specialized center, should be followed every two weeks, and this is works. The fortnightly ultrasound, it is effective for timely uh, detection of the, 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 the TTS and there are many different pathways involved in the twin to twin transfusion syndrome in the near future we will be able to um, to deal with that in a completely different perspective than we are dealing nowadays so thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoy I think we have time for, thank for you very much. some questions if I didn't blow the time thank you.